Um, unfortunately, Robbie won't be joining us today. He, uh, he got very busy in the emergency department. So yours truly will be tackling a case more nervous than last time. <laughs> um, I am gonna ask someone to please volunteer a case for me to tackle. Uh, while someone is volunteering a case, I'm gonna ask my great friend Kiara to unmute herself, introduce herself, where she's from, what time it is, what her role is, and then she'll pass the mic to our new addition, uh, Dr. Kirtan Patolia. Thank you so, so much. Um, well, I'm Kiara, and I'm sorry, my surname is misspelled. Uh, I'm from Peru. I'm a medical student. I'm like in the limbo from medical student, and I'm MD. And I'm so, so, so happy to be here. Um, just a little thing about Peru. I, I live in a very beautiful country, which is used to be a tropical country, but right now I'm so, so, so cold. I don't know why it's so cold right now. So I will let Kirtan introduce himself. Hello, good morning, everyone. So myself, Kirtan Patolia, I am a final year medical student from India. And I'm so excited to be here today. I will be scribing today and Kiara will be doing the teaching points. And I'm already seeing the Thiago today. So probably he's going to present the case. I'm always excited for that. And Reza looks so pumped up today. So I am so excited to learn more and more from Reza today. Let's see how it goes. Best of luck to all of you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Kirtan. And uh, Dhruv, unmute yourself. Tell us what's going on, my dear friend. So um, I guess today is a big day for me because um, today is going to be the day where I become Dhruv Srinivasachar, MD. Um, graduation is going to be in about a couple of hours or so. So I'm here in my regalia. <laughs> Dhruv, I can speak on behalf of the entire CP Solvers community. We all congratulate you and feel so fortunate to have you part of this community. Oh, shucks. Now, does anyone have a case to present? Um, while we're waiting for the case, I'm actually on service right now. So I can tell you about a patient that's on our team. That's pretty interesting. Uh, so this patient came in with confusion, fatigue, nausea, and their sodium, their serum sodium was 118. Now, who struggles with an approach to hyponatremia? Raise your hand. I definitely struggled for a decade and I'm still struggling. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Elena and Hans. Um, the, so I'm gonna teach a little bit about an approach to hyponatremia in the context of the patient I'm taking care of. And the um, main thing is this, is when someone is hyponatremic, the value is critical to incorporate into your decision-making. So if someone comes in with a sodium of 130, 131, hopefully you're not sending urine sodium, urine osm, serum osm. You get a history, you learn the patient's a little hypovolemic, you give some fluid, and then you recheck a sodium. As simple as that. I think when the sodium is like 128 or less, then it should grab your attention. And all of a sudden, the sodium becomes a center of gravity. Usually you don't see symptoms until less than 125. Now, let me ask you, how many people have been taught to approach hyponatremia based on volume status? Hypervolemia, hypovolemia, euvolemia. I was taught that for years. I want you to ignore what you've been taught if, you're actually going to approach hyponatremia that's less than 128, less than 125, start with the serum osmolality. And the reason for that is because it's very difficult to know what's happening intravascularly. It's very hard, like hypovolemia versus euvolemia, very difficult. So always um, start with the serum osmolality. And that's going to be very telling. Either it's going to be high, normal, or low. Usually we find ourselves in the low bucket, but for just one minute, let's entertain the other two buckets. So hyponatremia is significant. Um, start with serum osmolality. If the serum osms is high, it can be due to something like glucose. It can be due to something like BUN and someone with end-stage renal disease. It's important to know the difference between these two because BUN can go freely across the cell so it's not gonna draw water out of the cell. 
to contribute to the hyponatremia. While hyperglycemia, not all the glucose goes into the cell. Not all the glucose goes into the cell. So it draws water out of the cell. So hyperglycemia can cause hyponatremia. And of course, we know we can correct the serum soda, sodium for the amount of hyperglycemia. I don't want to focus on the hyperosmolar hyponatremia. The isoosmolar hyponatremia, this is called the whole pseudohyponatremia. Like what the heck is up with that pseudohyponatremia? This is what's up with it. So sodium concentration is serum sodium over water, right? When you check a sodium on a chem seven, it's doing sodium over plasma, not sodium over water. And so plasma is water plus paraproteins, plus triglycerides, plus lipoprotein. So if someone has isoosmolar hyponatremia, what it's telling you is that probably the serum sodium concentration is normal, but because the lab is calculating it based on the plasma and you might have triglycerides, it's giving you this false sense of hyponatremia, meaning that the lab itself on the CHEM7, the sodium is low. However, if you actually measure sodium over water, it's not low. So this all depends on how your lab measures sodium, but you can do the direct electrode tests, which only measure sodium over water, and no longer do you have pseudohyponatremia. You would probably have a normal serum sodium. Something I learned this past year, which is like, I don't want to overwhelm the audience, but something I learned is you can have hypoosmolar hyponatremia and hyperosmolar hyponatremia. They combine and you end up with isoosmolar hyponatremia. This might happen in the context of someone with end-stage renal disease with a high BUN and someone who's also hypovolemic. Okay, so that's another common cause of isoosmolar uh, hyponatremia. It's a combination. Does anyone have a case or do you guys still want to hear about uh, uh, Oriel fever? Is that Bartonella bacilliformis? Should I continue with the hyponatremia or is someone ready to present a case? Please go on. All right, Milayan, I'm going to continue to go on. Okay. All right. Thank you, Hans. So where you're going to usually find yourself is in the hypoosmolar hyponatremia. Your next step is urine osmolality. Urine osmolality. So remember, you start with serum osms. Then you go to, if you're in the hypoosmolar hyponatrium, which you usually will be, you go to urine osms. The way to tell the urine osms before the urine osm test actually comes back, look at the urinalysis. There's the specific gravity on the urinalysis. Take those last two digits, multiply it by 30, it estimates your urine osmolality. So if the, if the specific gravity is 1.010, what's the urine osmolality? Someone put it in the chat. If, you're, if your specific gravity is 1.010, what's the urine osmolality? Yes, thank you, thank you. 300. 300 happens to be a really good movie too. Has anyone seen 300? <laughs> this is Sparta. Okay, so you, you, you check the... Um, you, you check the urine osmolality. If the urine osmolality is less than 150, it can be of one of two conditions. What are those two conditions? One of two conditions. So hypoosmolar hyponatremia with a low urine osmolality. Yes, yes, there you go, thank you, yes. My, my best friend, Dr. Rez Zik is absolutely correct. Um, like if I ask Kiara to drink two liters of free water right now, or if I ask all of you to drink two liters, when we go and urinate, it's going to be clear. Your body is doing what it should be. If your serum is dilute, your urine should be dilute. So that's why if you have acute water intoxication, um, and I say acute water intoxication instead of psychogenic polydipsia, because actually the patient I'm taking care of right now was instructed to drink a lot of water by her doctor. And by drinking a lot of water, her specific gravity was 1.002. Her urine osmolality was 68. Her serum sodium was 118. And her serum osmolality was like 245 or 250. So by drinking too much water, primary polydipsia, you have a low urine osm, okay? The tea and to toast diet is interesting. If you don't 
if you don't consume solute, your kidney can only dilute the urine to a urine osmolality of 50. It can't dilute it further than that. It can't pee out completely free water. If you're not, if you're, if you're not consuming enough solute, you just, and your blood becomes hyponatrium because you're just not taking enough solute. You can't dump out a more dilute urine. So you're hyponatremic with the low urine osmolality. But that's not where you find it, you find yourself in the most. Where you find yourself is when the urine osmolality is high. This is when I start using the volume status, but I don't even use it yet. I send the urine sodium. So hypoosmolar, hyponatremia, high urine osmolality can be one of two things. Either there's a decrease in blood that the kidney is seeing. This will cause decreased effective arterial blood volume or something else. If the effective arterial blood volume is low, you activate the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. You reabsorb sodium, right? So what happens to the urine sodium? It's low, it's less than 10. So if you have decreased effective arterial blood volume from heart failure, for example, kidney disease, liver disease, or you're just hypovolemic, your RAS, renin angiotensin aldosterone is activated, so your urine sodium is low. So these patients with a high urine osmolality will have a low urine sodium. That's your clue, less than 10, okay? What's the, now, now what's the alternative that you have a high urine sodium? So if you have hydrochlorothiazide, SIADH, adrenal insufficiency, hypothyroidism, or cerebral salt wasting, you'll have a high urine sodium. Because in SIADH, you have inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, reabsorbing water, right? So your urine osm is high, but because you're not hypovolemic and your kidneys are seeing enough blood volume, your renin angiotensin aldosterone system is not activated. So you basically are dumping out some sodium. And that's why the urine sodium is high in SIADH. Hydrochlorothiazide, you're blocking the sodium chloride co-transporter. So urine sodium will be high. Adrenal insufficiency and hypothyroidism, they potentiate the activity of antidiuretic hormone, thereby, again, doesn't affect the sodium handling, your urine sodium is high. All right, folks, so for my patient, the main thing was she came in symptomatic hyponatremia, and what she needs right now is the ICU, because I'm worried if her sodium gets corrected too rapidly, uh, like, of course, if we free water restrict her because she was drinking too much, we saw her sodium go up, but it went from like 118 to 126. I don't want it to go up further. So I'm giving her D5 free water and I'm asking the nephrologist if we should start desmopressin. Yes, Alec. Beautiful. Desmopressin, DDAVP. Because remember, this patient's ADH is shut off due to the hyponatremia. And I think her sodium is going too fast in the north, north direction. So I want to reabsorb some water. At the end of the day, you need to do Q1 hour sodium checks because you don't want osmotic demyelination syndrome and the patient being a locked in state. And the problem with osmotic demyelination syndrome is you don't see it the next day. You see it weeks later. So you who caused the, in, not you, sorry, someone who may have caused the injury. I'm looking at Kiara as if like she's like, Someone who, who might have caused the injury may, um, you know, will not know what happened to the patient. And then they have this demyelination syndrome. So folks, that is, um, yes. Uh, Anne-Marie, that's a very good point. I wasn't actually aware of that. I'm not sure of the mechanism. Does anyone, can anyone unmute themselves and talk about the hypokalemia and osmotic demyelination syndrome? And then please, does anyone have a case, a case to present? We do have a case. Who has a case? Um, Gabriel has a case. Oh my gosh. Okay. So I have to put my neurology hat on. <laughs> this is, I'm going to say something neurologic until proven otherwise. All right. Let's go ahead and, um, yes, that's right. As you replete the potassium, the sodium goes up. Thank you, Alec. Let's go ahead, um, take over the whiteboard curtain and Gabriel, if, Gabriel, if you don't mind, unmute yourself, say, introduce yourself and let's get the case going. Hi everyone, very excited to be here today with you guys. I'm a second year medical student uh, from Lima, Peru. Uh, and I hope you like this case. Actually, it's kind of short, not very complicated, but a very, a, there's a nice part of this case that I learned and I hope you like it. 
So it starts with a 16 year old male presenting with the emergency room with bilateral um, lower extremity edema, a four grade, and he is in mildly distressed. He is with, he is severely distressed. And that will be the first aliquot. Thank you so much, Gabriel. Actually, usually when you present, it's some kind of infection. So I'm putting on my ID hat on right now. Gabriel, quick question. How old was the patient? 16. 16, got it. So young patient, young patient coming in with lower extremity edema. Um, and I think the first branch point is activating your schema for lower extremity edema, okay? With lower extremity edema, you want to ask the question, is it symmetrical or asymmetric? In general, the left leg usually is a little more swollen than the right leg because the left iliac vein is a little compressed by that right iliac artery. And maybe Kushal or someone can show Zavin's beautiful picture that says squish as that artery comes over that vein. Here we're dealing with bilateral lower extremity edema. So we have to prioritize three organs, the heart, the liver, and the kidney, and the kidney both in terms of renal failure and nephrotic syndrome. So we're gonna need much more information. I'm not worried about venous stasis. I'm not yet thinking about a less likely cause like a, a, a pelvic mass or some kind of lymphatic obstruction. I'm gonna prioritize the heart, the liver, the kidney, I'm going to remember that this is a young patient. This patient is probably healthy. And so um, there's something definitely going on here that we have to get to the bottom of. So my HPI is going to focus on those three organs. Gabriel, back to you, my friend. Mm -hmm. So the edema started one month ago, and it has been progressing. Um, and now it's presenting in the in the thighs is fourth grade edema and um, in in case of the past medical history uh, he only had two episodes of pharyngitis but it was five years ago not recently disease he has a down syndrome and with no heart complications or renal complications. In medications, he is taking um, salbutamol, I think in the US you say al albuterol. He has asthma. And family history, no remarkable social history, known health related behaviors, known and allergies. No, um, in case of the physical exam in the vitals, the temperature was 37. Uh, the heart rate was, uh, let me find, was 70, 74. Uh, respiratory rate was 20. And the pressure was 150 over 100. Uh, the skin uh, was no eteric, no cyanosis, noted. Um, the edema, as I said before, was fourth grade, was very severe. Uh, and the pulmonary exam, it was, uh, lungs were cleared and auscultations, abdominal exam, no remarkable, no visceromegaly, no splenomegaly. Cardiovascular exam, no, no regurgital, uh, regurgita, jugular ingurgitation, no, uh, was normal. And in case of the nervous system, he had a Glasgow of 14. Uh, but after, uh, but more about it, the the strength, the sensitivity was conserved. Um, maybe Reza, would you like to comment about the physical exam? Yes, before? please, Gabriel. Thank you so much. And Gabriel, just one question. This patient didn't have mm -hmm. orthopnea, proxismal nocturnal dyspnea, or any form of dyspnea, is that correct? No, uh, he didn't. Okay. So this is 
rare where we're only dealing with severe lower extremity edema that is quite impressive on Gabriel's physical exam. What did Robbie teach us about lower extremity edema? He said, when you see lower extremity edema, just look up. So you're looking at the patient's legs, look up and you can probably find an answer. So remember, let's go back to the three organs that we prioritize, the heart, the liver, the kidney. The normal jugular venous pressure, the lack of orthopnea and PND and dyspnea lessens the likelihood of heart failure. But I'll still send a pro BNP. I'll still look at a chest x-ray for cardiomegaly, but I'm less convinced of heart failure. The liver, the art exam is okay for liver enlargement. It's not the greatest, but really we're asking the question, does this patient have cirrhosis? And more specifically, does this patient have portal hypertension? Know how I made a difference between cirrhosis and portal hypertension? Because yes, cirrhosis is the most common cause of portal hypertension, but you can have non-cirrhotic portal hypertension. Worldwide, schistosomiasis is the most common cause of non-cirrhotic portal hypertension. I can tell you right now that this patient has no stigmata of cirrhosis in terms of spider angiomata, scleroicterus, pulmonary erythema, nail changes. So where um, we have no finding of cirrhosis, it doesn't exclude portal hypertension, but Gabriel didn't tell us that he saw distended abdominal wall veins like caput medusae. We'll keep that in mind. We'll keep that in mind. The one, one organ which you can't exclude based on the physical exam or history is nephrotic syndrome or kidney injury. On history, you may be told that the patient has a frothy urine that's a clue to proteinuria, more specifically albuminuria. But this, this exam basically doesn't allow us to make significant progress besides saying it's not cirrhosis, it's not heart failure. I still want a pro BNP I want a urinalysis looking at the albumin. I want a chem seven looking at the creatinine. And I would get liver chemistry tests, look at the AST, the ALT, and pending those results would guide my next steps in management. Uh, just, just for clarifying a question from the chat, uh, Kushal uh, asked about travel history Actually, he did visit Puno, that is a highland region in Peru. And Gabi said about the saturation of oxygen. I actually don't have uh, that information right now, but I remember it was okay. And yeah, is and maybe there another question? Gabriel, they, um, you know, that question reminded me is this edema? because there's a mimicker of pitting edema from the organs I discussed, and that's lymphedema. And that's non-pitting edema, and it has a specific appearance to it. It's very thick. It's just aggressive edema. It's not your typical fluid in the uh, interstitial space causing edema. How would you describe this patient's edema? Yes, it was pitting edema. Okay. And approximately eight millimeters of depth. Thank you so much. And Let's have some fun, Gabriel. Give us some. One year ago, he he visited Puno. I I I see like a question mark. Okay. Um. So in the in the labs, the first I would like to mention the urine labs. The pH of the urine was five five point five. Density was one thousand eighteen. Glucose negative. Proteins uh, three hundred milligrams in a 40 hours of recollection of urine. Uh, he had 18 red blood cells per camp, leukocytes one per camp, and a red blood cell uh, cast positive. Uh, the creatinine, the, the glomerular filtration rate estimated was 22.5. Uh, um, okay. Um, the proteins, uh, as I, okay, the proteins I said that exam, the uh, glucose, serum glucose was 70, uh, 78, 
um, urea was 112, uh, creatinine was four, and albumin was 1.5. Sodium was 146. Potassium was a 7.3. 7 Chloride was 109. And yeah, yeah uh, uh, in case of the liver exams, the T the AST was 40, the ALT was 42, and yeah, uh, is there maybe another exam you would like to know? And Gabriel, it seems that um, the liver chemistry tests were okay besides the albumin was 1.5. Uh, the did you say there was also red blood cell cast in the urine? Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, very good. And um, the the twenty four hour protein was just three hundred milligrams, correct? In twenty four hours. It, yes, uh, I think uh, I said it wrong. It was three grams in three grams uh, in twenty four hours. Three grams. Okay. All right. So this is really helpful. Look how much you you know. I want everyone to step back here because there's a lot to dissect. There's a lot to dissect, but remember just based on the HPI in the exam, we had ruled out or may, we said that liver and heart is less likely. And we said kidney is probably where the money is at. And here the center of gravity now becomes the kidney. Gabriel, you know how much I love diagnosis, right? But at this point, I'm not worried about diagnosis. I'm worried about management. That potassium has me scared. What happens when someone has hyperkalemia? You worry about abnormal heart rhythm and so sudden cardiac death. So I want everyone to imagine the, the PQRS complex and then the T wave. Can you see the T wave, Gabrielle, in my drawing? Yes? yes. Okay. So imagine that Gabrielle is grabbing this T wave and pulling it up, grabbing the T wave, pulling it up. Remember a peak T wave hurts when you sit on it, not tall peak. So Gabrielle pulls it up and then what does it do? It widens everything. The QRS widens, the PR widens, the P wave, the height of the P wave goes down. So that's the way you remember the findings of hyperkalemia on EKG. So you never forget, pull the T wave, peak T waves, widen QRS, flattening of that PR, um, lengthening of the PR, flattening of the P wave, okay? So right now, this patient needs interventions. This patient needs glu um, glucose and insulin. You have to give glucose with the insulin. It has to be IV or you're gonna precipitate potentially hypoglycemia coma. This patient needs laxatives. Get the K out of the body. So you're gonna push K into the cell, K out of the body. This patient likely needs dialysis, if we can't manage it medically, and if the kidney function doesn't improve. First, you got to try medical management. If that fails, then you reach for dialysis. So I would give this patient laxatives. I would give this patient insulin and glucose. You could do albuterol. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. And then you might even give this patient Lasix at a very high dose, like hundred milligrams, anything to get the K out of the system. Of course, our nephrology colleagues will be on board here. That's the management aspect of this case. Patients should be on, on, on telemetry if, if the hospital has telemetry. Look at the albumin. So how do we die? Remember, there's a difference between nephrotic syndrome and nephrotic range proteinuria. Nephrotic range proteinuria is when you have more than three grams to three and a half grams of protein per 24 hours. It's a triad. You have like more than three and a half grams of protein for 24 hour. The albumin is less than three and you have lower extremity edema. These patients often have hypertension. And actually, now that I look back at the physical exam, Gabriel, maybe this high blood pressure should have made us think of kidney injury because we weren't dealing with heart failure or liver disease. So that's another reason why we were heading down that path. So 
when I look at this and I see proteinuria at this degree, hypoalbuminemia, lower extremity edema, and hypertension, I, I say this patient has nephrotic syndrome. Now, why is it important to say that? Because now you can unleash a schema or an approach to nephrotic syndrome. But there's something really unique about this case, folks. Look at that urinalysis. Look at that mic microscopy, the sediment. When you have red blood cell casts, you have glomerular nephritis. There are, you know, it, it might be difficult to tell if, if you have red blood cell casts, but in this context with renal injury, this is looking like a mixed nephritic, nephrotic syndrome. Nephritic being the red blood cell cast and glomerular nephritis. You see, most causes of nephrotic syndrome don't cause kidney injury initially. Most causes do not cause kidney injury initially. There are some exceptions. So to me, now I got to prioritize glomerular nephritis. I got to prioritize glomerular nephritis. When you're dealing with the glomerular nephritis, break it down into three buckets. Is it immune complex mediated? Is it ANCA associated? Or is it anti-GBM, anti-glomerular basement membrane? When, when you do the biopsy, what are they looking for? If it's linear on immunofluorescence, that's anti-GBM. If it's posse immune, meaning you don't have much on that immunofluorescence, then you're dealing with ANCA. If you have immune complex deposition, like a lot of deposits, then it's immune complex mediated. So that makes me think I want complement levels. I want ANCA serology and I want anti-GBM. Now, if we apply the base rate of disease, the most common cause is, is going to be ANCA at 60% of GNs. At 30%, um, it's ANCA. I'm sorry, it's immune complex. And then the 10% is anti-GBM. So I'm sending complement levels. I'm sending ANCA serology. I'm sending anti-GBM. Um, and if we take this a little further, can we make any more progress? So I am framing this as a rapidly progressive GN that's like, you know, rarely manifesting as nephrotic syndrome. So I would prioritize the GN schema over the nephrotic schema mm -hmm. and, and I would pursue it in that direction. So maybe, Gabrielle, maybe this is a good place for you to give us some more data in terms of what happened to the potassium, how you managed that in the hospital. And then um, with regard to some of the preliminary stuff that we requested being the complements, the ANCA, the anti-GBM, and then we can take it from there. Yes, uh, thank you, Larissa. I'm loving the discussion a lot and the comments in the chat Actually, the, the patient was um, trans, uh, uh, how do you say, like, <laughs> please, someone who speaks Spanish, help me uh, derivar, like, trans, transferred, yeah, uh, yes, to the cardiology team, because the potassium was really high, uh, I, I don't know exactly what the management was for that, uh, but uh, because we were we were in the in the, in the like interrenal management, and um, and as you said, it was really interesting the age of the presentation, the severity of the edema, the potassium that was really high, and the estimated GFR that was twenty two point five, and that that was very low, and so. The patient first was stabilized, and then there were uh, we sent some data. Uh, first, uh, we sent the HIV test was non-reactive. The hepatitis B surface antigen was negative. The hepatitis C was negative. The RPR um, um, brucella was negative. And the ANCA also was negative. The anti-GBM was negative. Um, may maybe, Reza, would you like yes. to comment on those slides? Yes, Gabriel, you're making this challenging, my dear friend. <laughs> so, um, you know, and, and if we thought about, like many times, th like this patient is in a renal biopsy deficient state. 
meaning that this patient needs a biopsy and needs immunofluorescence of that biopsy sample. Also, electron microscopy and light microscopy would be helpful. But ANCA, ANCA associated causes of vasculitis, you can still have ANCA negative glomerular nephritis. And those include MPA, GPA, EGPA. MPA can affect young people. And MPA um, is associated with P ANCA and MPO. So I, just because the ANCA is negative, we can't eliminate that from our DDX, but the biopsy with immunofluorescence will help us. The HCV, the HBV, the HIV, all that being negative, the lack of infection, it just makes like an infectious immune complex cause of GN less likely. Um, the the complement level, uh, Gabriel, did you say the complement level was normal? That would be a very helpful branch point. Uh, yes, um, the, the C3 was 43, which was low. The C4 was eight, which was low. That's super helpful because that puts us in this sort of hypocomplementemic glomerular nephritis picture. You see, IgA nephropathy, usually it's normal complementemic. So now I'm starting to think about autoimmune stuff, the most common being lupus. This would be very odd for a young um, gentleman to have lupus, but it's possible. So I would send an ANA, um, and I don't think we have that yet, but I would send an ANA for lupus. Sjogren's can do this um, as another autoimmune cause. Malignancies like lymphoma can do this. Um, the fact that HCV is negative makes cryoglobulinemia less likely, though does not eliminate its possibility. So honestly, based on the data we have right here, I would prioritize an immune complex mediated process. I would still send anti-GBM. I would pursue a, a kidney biopsy. And specifically, I'd be interested in the immunofluorescence. Based on what we're seeing here, I wouldn't be surprised if we see granular deposits. And I would send an ANA and some of those rheumatologic serology. Gabriel, did you want me to comment on anything else or any questions about my thinking? Yes, please. Um, I think this aliquot will reveal that final diagnosis. Um, so uh, as you said, rest we sent a light microscopy and the, the biopsy of the, in the light microscopy showed increased glomerular cellularity and thickening of the vessels that was most compatible with diffuse proliferative glomerular nephritis and the electromyoscopy showed subendothelial immune deposits. And we also sent the anti-DNA and double stranded that was a highly positive, 861. And the ANA was also positive a, in a titers of one a, and 640, 640. And um, what, what I learned from this case is that, as you said, Reza, this, uh, this could be lupus, but the age and who the patient is, it was very uh, an unusual presentation of lupus because in the physical exam, we couldn't notice another stigmata of, uh, that could lead us to suspect of lupus. And it's very uh, interesting. And I learned from this case is that we have to keep lupus in our differential no matter who the patient is, because uh, as you can see in this case, lupus uh, sometimes cannot respect the age and the gender of the patient. And uh, another important thing that I learned from this case is that uh, it is not sufficient to diagnose lupus, but to diagnose the severity of the lupus and to manage and to do a correct management of it. Because sadly, uh, this patient, uh, uh, that that uh, the treatment um, wasn't um, enough for for the, for this patient, and he ended up he, he ended up in dialysis. Uh, he had a very um, poor 
um, prognosis of this disease. And it was kind of sad because we were wondering what we could have done differently in order to avoid it. Gabrielle, thank you so much for those reflections. And thank you for presenting the case um, so that all of us can benefit from this case and excellent teaching points and reflections. And that's a, a reminder to myself that it can always be lupus. And that would be a good cause of both GN and nephrotic syndrome. And it almost becomes more of an urgency to start immunosuppressive therapy to try to control the immune system from causing the, the GN. I, um, I had so much fun doing this exchange with you, Gabriel. Thank you. I want to pass the mic to my dearest friend, Kiara, um, to, uh, to teach us. And um, yeah, thanks again, everyone. What a, what a great case. Thank you, Gabriel. Amazing case, as always. And well, we had a very young male with uh, a concern about low bilateral lower extremity edema. This was as our first approach bilateral. So the first three organs or systems uh, that were in our minds were heart, liver, and kidney disease. Heart and, and liver, I'm sorry, heart, yeah, heart, liver, and kidney disease. Heart and liver were a little far because there were no signs or symptoms or heart congestion or, or yes, no, like cardiomegaly or liver like cirrhosis stigmas or portal hypertension. However, bilateral lower extremity edemas uh, was a little more consistent with kidney disease. It could be nephrotic syndrome or like a acute kidney injury. And uh, so the next thing to do was how to move, move forward. And uh, this was based on labs. We have to ask a, a pro BNP because we, we would like to uh, discard a heart failure problem, a urinalysis and liver function test. So with the electrolytes, we had hyperkalemia and this was a, a very big number. We had a 7.3 uh, of potassium, potassium. And this was bad because we, we were very concerned because this, this patient can have abnormal heart rhythm problems or sudden cardiac, cardiac death. So uh, uh, apart from all the findings we can have on the EKG, we have to think how we can treat this patient because this patient is in a very great risk. So uh, first we have to give him medications uh, and if these medications are not enough, we, this patient can undergo dialysis. The first medications this patient can receive are laxative, insulin, glucose, salbutrol, Lasix. The main objective of this is like to take off all as much as potassium we can, we can take. And then we have, uh, um, uh, we, we had, a new concern for nephrotic syndrome because this patient had proteinuria, edema, and low albumin. So uh, we had one one additional thing. This patient had red blood cell cast. So when you have a red blood cell cast, you can also have like an a nephrotic syndrome superimposed with this nephrotic syndrome. So you have to prioritize a glomerulonephritis schema over a nephrotic syndrome schema. So with glomerulonephritis, we also have a very broad spectrum of diseases, but we can prioritize with the most common one that is ANCA associated, which is like a 60%, then an immune complex mediated, like a 30%, and then anti-GBM, which is like a 10%. Then you can perform a biopsy and depend on the findings, you can uh, say that you have one or the other, for example, if you have like linear staining findings, you can have an anti-GBM disease. Or if you see pulse immune complex, you have an ANCA-associated uh, disease. Or if you have immune complex, you have an immune complex mediated disease. So finally, uh, this patient have hypocomplementemic glomerulonephritis, and then there are some also pathologies associated with this, like lupus, so Sjogren, malignancies, like lymphomas and cryoglobulinemia. And well, this case was uh, more likely uh, for lupus, despite this patient was very young and a male, 
I mean, not that, not because of the age, because lupus is more common in females than males. But well, this this case was like an an exception, and uh, we all love this case. Thank you so much. You're a phenomenal job as always. Thank you so much, my dear friend. Curtin, thank you for ascribing. Gabriel, thank you for presenting. Robbie, if you end up watching this, I really miss you. I, I don't ever want to discuss without you, my brother. Take care, everyone. Love you. Bye.